Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm your host and the publisher of uscfootball.com, Ryan Abraham. I'm in studio all by my lonesome. I'll tell you why in a second, but we're joined remotely. We got uh, Triple Double himself, Connor Morissette. He's over to my left. What's up, Connor? How's it going, Ryan? Good, good, good. You, he's freshly back from uh, San Diego, where USC defeated Louisville in the Holiday Bowl 42-28, to so we'll get his thoughts on that. And we got Shotgun Spratling way on the East Coast, where I just came from. Shoddy, how you doing, man? Hanging in there. He's here. And uh, we're all together uh, remotely, but we're not together in studio. Usually Connor would be in here. I came home from my Christmas trip and ended up getting uh, tested positive for COVID today, so couldn't have Connor come in. I feel I'm feeling fine. I mean, I'm doing the show and everything, but uh, got the Rona my second <laughs> second time doing this. Uh, but hopefully things are going to be okay and uh, go through. But we're we want to do the show because USC got a big win, which I don't know. Remember in bowl games, if there was the least amount of hype and the least amount of expectations going into a bowl game as there was for this one. I mean, USC's been like crushing off-season stuff and then there would be disappointments like in season and then the last you know six weeks or so there were sort of like disappointing off-season stuff with like the recruiting class being in like the high teens and not really just crushing the portal and a lot of guys leaving so the off-season stuff the off the off whatever you know it wasn't like great and then the on the field stuff they actually came out and played well they Blocked and tackled, which this game is largely about, and they end up getting a, a big win. So we want to talk about all that. Connor was there, like I said. Shotgun and I were watching on our couches, or I'm not sure exactly where he was watching. We are uh, live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or X, or whatever you want to call it now. So if you are on YouTube or Facebook, you should be able to put a comment uh, during the stream, and I can put it up on the screen, um, like... We have one up here that says Miller Moss. Yes, huge. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the, maybe the old comment. Let me try that one again. Uh, <laughs> of course, that's not working, but we'll try it one more time. Okay, here we go. I think it's working now. Yes, Miller Moss. Uh, huge game for Miller Moss. Sets a USC record. Six touchdowns in a bowl game. Pretty impressive uh, for him. So I'll try to put your comments up there on the screen. We are not going to do live calls uh, today just because we're going to try to keep this an hour. USC basketball Tips off at 6 p.m. We're doing on the West Coast. We're starting this at 5 p.m. So we'll try to keep this a tight show, kind of get everyone's thoughts on the game and get you guys, you know, talking about this again. Because, again, it was really exciting to see this team without Caleb Williams, with only 52 scholarship players available to play and get a big win. Look good. Defense tackling. I mean, it was it was kind of crazy. But, Connor, you were there. Maybe we'll get your thoughts to, to start. I mean, this was I, – I liked your instant analysis with Chris. But, man, this was uh, – I, I was surprised. I don't know if you were surprised and in, in what you kind of think of this one. I was certainly surprised. I thought they would lose by 10 points, I said, in the pick em, so wrong on that one. The big story, Ryan and Shotgun, has to be Miller Moss with how he performed. USC goes three and out on the first drive, and then they allow a touchdown to Louisville. And I'm sure we all thought the same thing. Here we go again. But then they buckle down. Max Williams gets the strip sack. USC gets a short field for the first touchdown drive. And then they were rolling. So Miller Moss is the big story. And then I think the secondary story is just that's a big win for Lincoln Riley because finishing the regular season one and five, they needed some good news. And you mentioned it, Ryan, not really winning the offseason the last few weeks. You have all these guys enter the transfer portal, some shakeups on the defensive staff. And then for USC to come out, really buckle down during the last six weeks, practice well and get buy-in from all the guys who stayed and proved that they wanted to be there and, and win that game. That made Riley look good. I, I thought that made the program look good. And for the first time since the Rose Bowl, USC ends the season with a bowl win. So that's really significant in my opinion because that hasn't happened in a few years here. So it's not all good news, of course, but how can you not be happy and smiling after a big game like that? I, I thought USC did everything that they needed to do the fans have some hope and they haven't really had much hope here in the past few weeks. So that's the most significant part of it for me. I agree with you. I mean, we kind of plan our off season and it was sort of like, Oh, there's going to be nine months of fans complaining. Uh, oh, the, who's going to be the quarterback. This is going to suck. And you're like, Oh, Miller boss looks pretty good. Like you have a good option there. Uh, you might go to the transfer portal. We'll talk about that and stuff. But I think now like just the, that 60 minutes of football could change the next several months of 
hey, there's a little bit more optimism that the defense can play better and the offense can still be good without your generational quarterback, Caleb Williams. But Shotgun, what were your kind of thoughts on the game? I mean, we, we knew there was going to be questions going into this offseason, but I think the questions have changed now. I mean, the questions were going to be uh, all in the center on the defense and what is USC going to do and how is this? how different can things be next season? How much change can actually happen? And you go, oh, Lincoln Riley can actually coach and can motivate again. You know, some, some people had doubted that after, you know, the recent, you know, turn of events for USC at the end of the season. But I think you the question now is, is Miller Moss the quarterback going in? Instead of, you know, all the questions of, you know, is USC doomed? Is Lincoln Riley going to leave for the NFL? Is Lincoln Riley going, you know, is USC going to fire Lincoln Riley? All these random rumors we, we keep popping up on our message boards and stuff. Now it's back to about football and can USC be great again next year? Can they get the right people in? And it makes you wonder what happened this season. Um, you know, seeing the effort, seeing the tackling, seeing – all the things that we thought were potential for this team coming into the season. That's what I expected out of this USC defense this season. You know, they weren't great, but they were good. They were good enough, plenty good enough when you score 42 points. And the offense was going to put up points, we felt like, throughout the season if the defense could be at least decent. And, you know, they were flying around the ball. The tackling was fantastic. Get a lot of credit to Taylor Mays. The secondary, in particular, the tackling – with seven bodies, the secondary, um, you know, looked fantastic. I, I thought that was a real standout point outside of Miller Moss. That one was one that caught my eye for sure. Uh, some of those young guys that hadn't had time, like Anthony Beavers, getting opportunities, and maybe he's not even a young guy now, you know, being a, a third-year guy in the program. But those guys making the most of their opportunities. Prophet Brown making the most of his opportunities. Jacoby Covington is showing he can be a shutdown guy on one side instead of being a guy that's rotated in and out uh, with other guys that are – not with the program, or there are question marks about where they are with the program with someone like Sierra Wright. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of positivity that comes out of this and hope going forward. And I don't know that we thought that that was going to be the case. Even if you would have said they would have won, yeah, it probably would have to be a, you know, 45 42 shootout type of win. And you might come out confident in the offense again. But I think this gives you a lot of confidence in what the defense can become, especially if they get the right guys in and everyone fighting for each other. And that was interesting to hear those comments afterwards from the players talking about how the six weeks has been since the season ended and the different things they've had to do. And I liked a lot of the changes that were made just to, you know, Lincoln Riley said they had to change, completely change the game plan defensively because of the opt-outs, because of those injuries that they were going to have. And I'm thinking that means, hey, you got seven people uh, in the secondary – they played more zone, something they hadn't really done all season. And they did it because that takes less energy a little bit. That's part of the reason why it went into it. And you saw those guys get tired towards the end of the game, but they still found a way to get the win. So I think there's a lot of positives to come out of this, and a lot of hope that you can take from it that USC's not as far away as we would have definitely thought they were after that UCLA game. And maybe that's going back to Lincoln Riley also. Oh, we're one or two plays away. There were a little bit more than that. But they're still not as far away as you know can be overcome in a, a with a really good offseason. And that's going to be the question. Can they go have a really good offseason springboarding off of this Holiday Bowl win? I like what you said. Um, and this sort of like when you see them play like this with only seven guys available in the secondary and you play five, you know, so that's there's not a lot of uh, backups there. Um Losing Caleb Williams, losing Brendan Rice, losing Marshawn Lloyd. I mean, all that, that, that you know goes on and on about who was not going to be in this game. And you put an effort out there that looks like that's good. Like it was like, okay, you're missing some guys. You could still play well. It was above what they were playing with, with the full complement of players that they had, not below it. And I, I think your question of what the hell happened this season is valid because it's like, they should have been, with the talent they have out there, they should have been way better. Like, oh, they didn't play a lot of zone. The 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 not the, the inability to make any sort of changes on defense where you're just like, hey, we're going to mix it up and play some zone because we're just getting burned. every ma We play man-to-man -man all the time, and one guy misses his assignment, and it's a touchdown. And they never got away from that. And, you know, this is just one of those things where what the hell happened? Like, you, this was really almost like a throwaway season when you can just sort of like coach them up a little bit better with less dudes, less talent, and 
get the kind of performance you saw uh, last night. I mean, it, it just it's like a head scratcher to especially how the season ended, you know, and even the games, if, if someone put a comment in there, this was the only game USC won that you actually felt good about. It was, it was probably the best you USC fans have felt after a game. Um, you know, most of the other wins, like triple overtime, triple overtime against Arizona now looks pretty good because they are good, but at the time it did not. And, you know, the allowing a lot of points to some of the lower team, the lesser teams on the schedule, Colorado's comeback and all that. There wasn't a lot of like feel good after a game. This one was. So I think you're right. There's, it's encouraging that you could have a depleted team and still play at a very high level. And uh, I think that's what, you know, USC fans could kind of cling to going forward. But I, I was not expecting this to be like a feel good thing. This was sort of just like, get this ball game out of the way and move on. But it ended up being like a feel good moment for fans, which is crazy. To answer the question about what was so wrong with the team, I think you have to start with Alex Grinch and we've piled on him. So I don't want to spend too much time there, but he was certainly a problem. And then I think in a weird way, RJ made this point to me earlier, and I think it's a really good one. Having fewer scholarship guys available might have helped in a one-off bowl game situation like this where you had all this time to prepare. Like the linebackers, if they make one mistake here or there, it's not, oh, you're getting pulled on the next series because we have someone else who was a really highly rated recruit, and even though he isn't playing well, we got to give him a chance because you just made a mistake. And the same can be applied to the cornerbacks. Prophet Brown, I thought he had a really good game. I don't really remember him messing up, but say he maybe did something that wasn't perfect. I don't think he felt much pressure like, okay, if I make one little mistake, I'm out on the next series because we have these other players who were highly rated recruits and I'm just lucky to be out here for whatever reason. You know what, you know what I mean by that? I think having fewer guys help them in this situation and having all these guys be so bought in was important. You look at all the people who left in the transfer portal, all those negative headlines, that might have helped USC because I don't know how bought in a lot of those guys were at the end of the year. You had everyone bought in in this game. And even though there weren't as many bodies as usual, I think the buy-in factor was huge and not having – a lot of pressure on these guys, I think, was important as well. Defensively, they couldn't really stop the run, but they played well enough to win, certainly only allowing the 28 points. And that's all we could have asked for all season. I, I still think they have a long way to go, and Danton Lynn is going to come in and should help that unit for sure. I think the, the lack of pressure these guys were playing with was significant, and to me, that really factors into it. I don't know how you feel on that shotgun. Yeah, I, I think that you look at it, and I, I think not having anything to lose in this game it definitely makes things a little bit easier in that regard. Um, but I, I think, you know, there were mistakes still made. You know, they blew a couple coverage. Some people were saying, hey, we didn't see any blown coverages. Like the very first play, the guy's running wide open, Louisville doesn't connect. They give up a ton of run yards on the ground, but they found a way still. And I think that says something about the team playing for each other. And so they were – I thought they were playing with nothing to lose. But I think they, it was just – they were wanting to win for each other, and that is such a huge part of football in general, particularly college football, and that's one of the things that is being learned by coaching staffs across the country in with the transfer portal era is how do we get everybody in here, everyone bought in, get talented players, but guys that are going to play hard for each other, and if something doesn't go right, then they're not going to shut it down then they're not going to, you know, woe is me or put their head down or start focusing on something else, um, you know, whatever it may be. Find the guys that will find a way to make things work. Chris Thompson was was a captain, and, you know, he's not going to be back with the program next year. He's already entered the transfer portal. Lincoln Riley mentioned him, uh, I think, in the post-game, uh, either the post-game interview uh, on t broadcast or in the post-game presser, so he's not going to be with us, but we made him a captain because he's a guy that's that's going to fight for us tonight. They knew, he, you know, they had, he'd been very upfront. Hey, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to get more opportunities. But he's been a solid special teams contributor. They made him a captain, and everyone rallied around those four captains, four new captains for this game. I thought that was an interesting tidbit there. And even guys that were playing that had been captains, like Justin Dietrich and Jonah Monheim and Mason Cobb, were not captains for this game. They went out and said, hey, and Lincoln Riley basically said, this is a new team for this game. It's a one-off, one one game together. We're going to choose new captains. Miller Moss is one of them. Taj Washington, pretty obvious why those two guys are going to be. Taj Washington deciding to play through. Chris Thompson deciding, I'm in the transfer portal, but I'm going to play with you. And he got some run at linebacker and looked pretty good in there as well, as well as playing a ton of special teams. Um, so I, I just thought they were playing for each other. 
And that's such an underrated aspect. We look at star ratings all the time, and we look at all the hype coming into a season about what players have done in previous places in the transfer, you know, before they transferred or what they've done in high school. But the biggest thing of coaching is putting all those pieces together. X's and O's are really, really important. But if you get everyone pulling in the same direction in a tug-of-war game, it's much better than having the strongest guys, but everyone's pointing, pointing in four different directions. So I, I think that is really impressive to me, that what the coaching staff did in that six weeks leading up and the players, what they did together, coming together with all the negativity surrounding the end of the se- second half of the season, all the negativity surrounding all the players leaving and whatnot. They said, we want guys that are going to want to be here and we're going to play for the guys that do want to be here. And they went out and showed it. And when you do that, You play to such a different level. Suddenly now, when there is a fumble, you recover it. And that's a little bit of luck, right? But it just somehow finds its way into one of your guys' hands instead of the other teams. And that's kind of what it was last year, this team. You created all those turnovers and stuff, but the camaraderie was the thing that stood out the most of how they came together, which is why it was so disappointing and so um, kind of baffling that they never came together as a team this season, in, in my opinion, that they were able to do it last year in such a short time frame with such a, a roster turnover. I thought they would be able to build on that coming into this year, and they weren't able to do that. But you saw when they put all the pieces together, even if they don't, if, even if it's not, you know, pristine, they can still find a way. Hey, we don't have a run game. Miller Moss throws for six touchdowns. We can't stop the run, but we're not letting Jake Plummer throw for 400 yards against us like he did last year. And that's that's the same Jake Plummer. You know, he, they did, he did dislocate his finger early in the game, and you know maybe that affected his accuracy on a couple of balls. But same guy that threw for 400 yards in a terrible offense at Cal last year, threw for like, what, 160 or something in that game, or 200 maybe? Like, that's the vast difference in, in this. And that's with, all, you know, five, what, five guys playing backup positions? Like, Jalen Smith is, is a starter, but he was, you know, playing safety in this game. Um, you've had Max Williams and Bryson Shaw have started at different times, but – they didn't start this game, Anthony Beavers did. So five new guys, if you don't want to call Jacoby Covington a, a regular starter, five guys in different positions, and it was one of the best secondary efforts we've seen all season, not only in coverage but also in tackling. USC had six mixed tackles in this game, and four of them were by one player. So uh, the rest of the team had two missed tackles. That was incredible. Didn't have a ton of penalties. They just played like a completely different team. And the hope now is that it's not just a one-off game. As Lincoln Riley called it, this is you know a new team. This is one game they're going to play together. They can carry that momentum forward. Last year, all the momentum was, was against them going to the offseason. And they had a slogan. The slogan didn't work. Now, can you carry the momentum from this Holiday Bowl win? It's not the bowl game you want to do. We show in Lincoln Riley getting eggnog on him. You think Lincoln Riley coming to this season was like, man, I just hope I can get some eggnog poured on me this season. Rather than raising a, a different type of trophy, being in the college ball playoff? No, but look, look at the smile on his face. Even when he's getting eggnog poured on him, he was excited about this, and he called it one of the most fun wins he'd had as a coach. Yeah, for sure. Um, this was There was a lot there, Shotgun. I had like five thoughts sorry, along the way, sorry. and I was just like, oh, I'll, I'll mention this, and then I'll mention this. I'm like, oh, then you kept going. I'm like, all right, uh, we can't go with this, all, all those things. Um, but one thing I did want to mention we haven't really talked about, you were talking about some of the guys playing um, – you know, we, we saw, uh, you know, guys having to fill into roles where they weren't really playing before just because there was less bodies there. We haven't talked really about the offensive line, and we did have a comment about that from Paul. Uh, they found the right combo on the offensive line last night. So I know you were there, Connor. What was – give everyone kind of a breakdown of what they were doing because, you know, your your left tackle wasn't the left tackle anymore. I mean, they made some significant changes. And, again, sort of like what they did on defense, you're like, oh, well, maybe you could have – um, you could have done, you could have done this during the season too, but what Connor? What were your thoughts on the offensive line? The headliner was true freshman Elijah Page getting the start at left tackle. I believe he only allowed one pressure and was solid in the twenty five pass blocking snaps he had. I said it on instant analysis. If you're not noticing an offensive lineman, it's usually good. And I didn't really notice him outside of when I watched him, and I felt like he he really had a nice game. So that was encouraging. And I saw a tweet from Jamil Muhammad who just talked about how Elijah Page, like, this guy is for real and watch out going into next season. So he rotated a little bit. He didn't play left tackle the whole game. Mason Murphy came in, who also played some right tackle. 
And then you saw Justin Dietrich play center as he did all season. Jonah Monheim kick inside. And Emmanuel Pregnon was on the inside as well. Jared Kingston rotated in a tackle. So it just seemed like the six weeks that USC had to practice, that was really helpful for them because they had all those issues that we talked a lot about all those weeks back. And to figure out the offensive line, that was huge. Elijah Page had made great strides from when he came into the program, being able to start in a bowl game as a true freshman, even though he is a little bit older, that was really significant. And I just wonder, like looking back, Ryan, we talked about this on the Peristyle podcast, Jonah Monheim being the left tackle when that was announced all the way back in media day. And I remember my thought was, oh, cool. He's the best player on the line. That makes sense. I think that was more of a warning sign than a good thing looking back at it. And it seems like if Jonah stays, that'll be great. It's not going to be at left tackle. He still has a decision to make. But Elijah Page, you have your left tackle. That was a big question. It looks like you have your quarterback and your left tackle. And who would have thought that uh, a few days ago heading into this one? So that was the most encouraging point for me on the offensive line is Elijah Page. Yeah, we talked about the, on the Parasol podcast, like Alani Noah, like starting the first game, you're we like, that should have been like a woo, 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 there's problems here. And uh, moving Monheim in there and it looked, they looked a lot better. Um, that was great. We did get a super chat. Uh, Kevin um, says, do you think uh, Danton Lynn helped in some way? Uh, I think so. So thanks for the super chat, by the way. You don't have to do that, but that's cool. We got a couple bucks from from Kevin. Happy holidays to you. Thank you for that. And please hit the, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the, uh, the like button. We like that. But um, I asked Lincoln Riley at practice, would the new coaches be involved in the defensive game plan? He said, no, they're going to be recruiting and all that. Um, maybe it was the audition factor that players wanted to play harder, but I also, I tweeted this out when Lincoln Riley got hired in you know November of 2021, USC, had a stinker when they played Cal and Lincoln Riley was the head coach. That could have been an audition moment for everybody on the team. And that didn't seem to motivate anybody, but the defense looked a lot more motivated, but any thoughts on this one? If you want to go shotgun, you can go first. I, I would say that I think the audition factor did play into it. I think even that Cal game, I just think USC wasn't very talented in that 2021 season. Um, and, you know, with Jackson Dart going down early, Miller Moss being thrown into the mix, your backup not getting all the reps during the, during the week, all that. And there was different motivation then, you know, six weeks, you can kind of, after that disappointment of the UCLA game, you can start building them back up to be a little more motivated versus this game has been thrown on to the end of the season. Everyone else is already done. You have one week to, you know, and it wasn't, the audition factor wasn't, uh, you know, three weeks building up going into the game like it was for Denton Lynn. It was three days or, or whatever it was for, for Lincoln Riley being on campus and, checking them out at practice and whatnot. And that team had some turmoil and stuff going on too with players not wanting to play and some people not traveling. That one, I think there was 47 scholarship players that traveled for that game, if I remember my, my count from that one. Uh, I looked it up last night. I think that's what I said. Uh, last night, Connor kind of 53 players. Um, so, you know, a little bit more there. But I just think the audition factor of, yeah, let's go out and, and make some plays. And I thought that the same thing happened in that Cal game. They just weren't as talented. Yeah. Riley talked about it. Sorry to cut you off, Ryan. Just after the game, how Brian Odom and Sean Nua, he, he didn't mention them directly, but he talked about members of the staff who probably aren't going to be here next season, but choosing to stay, they could have opted out and left for a, a different opportunity. But him talking about staff members doing that made me think of those two guys. And, and I think the audition factor is huge, but those guys deserve credit for the game plan. And for what USC was able to do in that one. Maybe Danton Lynn helped here or there if, if a guy in the secondary had a question or something. I, I don't exactly know what lengths he's uh, been at, with, with helping the team right now. Just at practice, he's there, but it looks like he's more watching than, than doing stuff from what we're able to see. So Sean Nua and, and Brian Odom, it's been a tough year for those guys, but I think to what Shotkin said earlier, they had to revamp the game plan a little bit. And USC's defense from a personnel standpoint, was certainly limited this season, and we saw that it was limited in the game. But the fact that the team was able to get the win and play a lot better than they had all season against a, a good opponent, I think those guys deserve more credit than Danton Lynn does in, in, in that regard. But the audition factor can't be overstated. I, I agree with that, too. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we did get a, uh, a super chat. I want to pull this one up there from Maurice. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, he says, uh, Miller Moss had a um, had on-time throws and played within the scheme of the offense, a great sign. I want to, yeah, you know, Miller yeah, we get into the Miller Moss stuff because, like, 
he made his audition for QB1. If you want to talk about what you saw Shotgun and then Connor maybe chime in about what Lincoln Riley said about Miller and stuff. But yeah, let's let's do a little Miller Moss talk. Yeah, I mean, he, some of the throws were terrific. I mean, the the window throw that he threw to Kyron Hudson, that was through four defenders. Um, it's one of those, oh, no, oh, no throws from a coach. And then you're like, whoa, he fitted in there. Uh, he did miss a couple throws. He had Zachariah Branch a couple times over the middle. He threw a couple balls behind guys. He's a little skittish early. But I thought it was awesome to see, you know, that first drive did not go well. The second drive wasn't great. Um, and they missed the field goal. Deuce Robinson, the ball goes through his hands. And then even when they score the first touchdown with Taj Washington, that's not a very good throw by Miller Moss either. And Taj Washington picks him up. But you just saw his confidence growing and growing as the game progressed. And I thought that was really fun to, to watch, especially, you know, I've known Miller since he's, uh, I think, 13, 14 years old. His first first time I saw him at a USC camp, just kind of pointing him out and be like, that ball comes off that kid's hands. No clue who the hell he is. Ball comes off that kid's hands, great. Um, you know, got to find out who he is type of thing. Um, and, and, you know, it was fun to see him really run the offense. But he also showed you, hey, I can move around the pocket and I can throw on the run, connect with Jacoby Lane. But he gave his guys opportunities at times in, in, at times as well. I thought Lincoln Riley really designed a really good game with the screens and stuff early in the game, the, the crossers where it wasn't putting too much on him so that he could gain his confidence. But it was so much fun to watch him as he progressed in that game. And then after the interception, I think that shows you everything you need to know about him as a person and as a potential QB1. That is a huge game-changing play. You go from about to be up 21 points at minimum 17, so a three-score game, to now they're in position, they score, and that's a seven-point game again. You can wilt after that. We've seen players wilt after a big mistake like that. He didn't. Third downs, the, I think the next two third downs, that, uh, third downs in that next drive, connected on both of those. One of them a very nice catch by Jacoby Lane behind him to help him out, but he just got better and better, and the third downs in that game were really telling – because Louisville had been so good against teams on third down. I think it was something like 28% or something coming into the game, somewhere in the 20s. Um, and in this game, USC went 6 of 10 on third down. So that was really telling to me. And I thought, I mean, they put the ball in Miller's hands over and over and over. I thought they could have used the run game a little bit more. Instead, they trusted Miller, gave him the opportunity. And, you know, as his confidence grew, he made tougher and tougher throws as the game progressed. Brian, I saw the chat that you put on the screen there about Miller versus Caleb, and I think every USC fan who has watched all these games with Caleb Williams, the guy is so talented, he's going to be the likely number one overall pick. The skill sets, Caleb Williams is a generational player, but I think there's something to be said about the hunger and the desire and Miller waiting so long for his opportunity and I, I just think the mental side of, of his game and, and his specific situation we need to talk about that a little bit. It's a guy who sat behind Caleb for two years and has been like a sponge with Lincoln Riley and Cliff Kingsbury this year, just waiting for an opportunity. He gets his opportunity. And if he didn't play well, then what are we talking about today? It's, oh, USC needs Will Howard. USC probably needs a couple quarterbacks in the transfer portal. Big question mark at quarterback for next season. He really only had one opportunity to stake his claim. And he went out and did it he was really hungry to do so there was so much desire and so much passion there and I I think with Caleb Williams at the end of the season of course he wanted to win and he wanted to play well but the situations are so different and I seeing what that that YouTube commenter said just about the different situations with those two guys I think when you win a Heisman Trophy and you come back the next season you're the number one overall draft pick you're going to get a little bit comfortable there's nothing wrong with that but Miller Moss he, he was uncomfortable in this game and he know he, he knew he needed to make a a big impression and there was pressure on him and, and it was just really refreshing because I think Caleb Williams maybe got a little bit comfortable this season and, and, and I don't really blame him for that it was refreshing to see a guy in Miller Moss's situation come out and, and really seize the day and it, it was a little bit different compared to Caleb Williams this season and, and I love to see those two guys embrace after the game because there was a lot of mutual respect between those two just the dichotomy between those two guys was striking to me and I'm just so happy for Miller Moss today had the big moment and he took it that's awesome it was great for him, and I, I tweeted this out too. His first touchdown pass was kind of like, I think it was like a little dump off. It was, it was okay you know, to Taj Washington, who beat up a couple guys and ran in. His other five were all into the end zone, or like the one, the Jacoby Lane one. I'll, I got a picture of that. Um, I mean, that was that was pretty sick. Uh, you know, when he, he looked great. But you look at that, 
And there was one, I think the Deuce Robinson one might have been like he caught it at the two, but was like running in. Like there were, they were, these were throws that were, these were touchdown passes, not a screen pass that a guy runs 40 yards for a touchdown. I mean, he threw balls into the end zone and the receivers caught him. And to have Jacoby Lane and Makai Lemon, uh, you know, along with like Taj Washington, Dorian Singer had a catch. Um, Carson Tabarucci had a catch. Like that was kind of crazy. I was like, what? Like I've never expected that. It was like a, you know, and then he throws the interception like right afterwards. Um, but seeing these young guys get some run, the one guy, you know, Zachariah branch was the one that really didn't do that much. But, uh, I think it's really encouraging knowing that this young group of receivers and a guy like Miller Moss can run this offense and you feel pretty good about it from the off season. But it was, I was pretty impressed by that. Like his throws into the end zone. Yeah, and, and like the Tabarachi throw, finding the seam right there, that's something USC has not really done really well this season. It's been open a couple times, and there's been so much pressure in Kayla Williams' face that you get Lake McCree wide open against Notre Dame on that first drive, and there's pressure right in his face. He throws it high. It's an interception. I, I thought the offensive line gave him time, but also I was really impressed with Miller Moss taking some hits. You know, didn't shy away when he when he took some that Deuce Robinson throw you mentioned. They roll the pocket right because everything they're basically you know clearing out the to the right side, kind of like a flood route. They you know send Deuce Robinson across on a crosser, and instead he jets self uh, takes off on it. Uh, you know, kind of a cross and go type of thing, and perfect play call. But he moves over, and there's a stunt, and a guy comes free. Miller Moss delivers a perfect throw, and then takes a huge hit on it. He did that a couple times where he took some big hits and still made the throw, so that was impressive. Now there was a couple balls under the throw. The Jacoby Lane first touchdown, he threw with someone in his face off off uh, platform. He doesn't have the same arm strength as Caleb Williams, but got it there, gave his guy a chance, and Jacoby Lane goes to it. And that's something that that Caleb that Miller Moss does a little bit or has shown he will do more often than Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams, it just seemed like to me the last two years, this was not something that suddenly came about. But he felt like he could continue to create a play that something would come open if he created with his legs that he didn't need to fit that tight window throw. They didn't need to try to attempt that one that might get tipped or might be an overthrow because he could elude a guy and then keep it open and then get somebody that's wide open. Whereas Miller is like, hey, I'm going to throw it up and give my guys a chance. and I'm going to let Jacoby Lane go make a play. I'm going to let Deuce Robinson go make a play. Those type of things. Use those big body guys. Use Taj Washington underneath and throw it short of the sticks and let him go run. So he was willing to do those things, um, may maybe a little bit more than Caleb Williams had been at times this season. So, you, you know, he every pass wasn't perfect. I had a couple of people saying, oh, he underthrew a couple throws. He missed Zachariah Branch over the middle twice. Those could have been both touchdown passes. So that's the one guy who didn't put any stats up from the freshman group. But how about that young group, like you talked about, making plays for him? Jacoby Lane coming back for that touchdown. Makai Lemon stretching out to catch that first one over the middle that really kind of – took the top off for the offense. It's like, okay, we can, you know, relieve some pressure and let them go. And then also the J Jacoby Lane third down catch I mentioned earlier, when the momentum was going against USC, Louisville had scored after the interception, and he just catches it, you know, sliding kind of with his feet out from under him, reaches back and makes a tremendous catch. That was probably the catch of the game. And then as Miller's confidence grew, you saw that touchdown pass right there to Jacoby Lane. Just an absolute perfect throw back corner of the end zone. And Jacoby Lane showing what, he's going to be capable of being a Randy Moss type of guy on the outside of being able to go up over defenders and catch balls routinely. So a lot of things to be excited about in that receiving core as well. But Miller Moss, you know, like I said, everyone was making plays around him. The offensive line, it felt like, hey, they blocked for that extra half a second to give him a chance. The wide receivers, hey, they made those catches that were behind them. Whereas, you know, there are times this season where, People didn't make catches for Caleb Williams. So all those little things just seem to add up. And I think that's the product of Miller Moss being a locker room guy that everyone enjoys. And Miller Moss, it was great to see because, like I said, I've known him for a long time. This is a kid who grew up. His first real memory, if I remember correctly, was USC destroying Illinois in a Rose Bowl. So he has always wanted to play in a Rose Bowl. He's always wanted to have that. You know, when he committed, he talked to me about you know going to Matt Leiner camps as a, as a youth. Growing up watching Mark Sanchez, I think it was Mark Sanchez Illinois game was the first one. John David Booty, one of those two. So watching those guys, watching Matt Barkley, all that type of stuff. So that made it even more of a fun night and a fun moment to see Miller Moss thrive and you know when he got his opportunity, make the most of it. He's a guy who 
wants to be a Trojan, like you talked about, Shotgun, and Lincoln Riley said after the game how important that is. Guys who, even when things aren't going well, believe and don't leave at the first sign of trouble. One other thing with, with Miller, too, that I think is so important, the guy just hasn't taken that many live reps. So some of the throws, it's kind of like, okay, maybe he missed that throw, maybe he missed that throw. But I, I think going forward, the tape will be out on him the more he plays, so defenses will adjust, and he'll have to adjust to those adjustments. Funny thing to say. I just think that the potential for him is, is really great because he hasn't played a lot of football. And with Lincoln Riley kind of pulling the strings and he, he's really molded Miller these past few years, it's an exciting time to be a USC fan. And I didn't think uh, I'd be saying that. I mean, I, I've been accused of being Mr. Negative on these shows all season long. And I'm, I'm smiling because of Miller, <laughs> how, how well he played and just the excitement that I have for him. Because, yeah, once people see what he's able to do, then – defenses will adjust like i said but i i just think the more reps this guy gets he could get a lot better yeah, yeah. first first start in four years basically remember he missed his senior year of, yeah. of high school football because of covid so first start in four years and basically first true game time in you know second true game time in that four years the cow game being the other one that we mentioned earlier where he came in for jackson dart and injured jackson dart yeah um you mentioned something earlier shotgun about the usc had a weird six weeks off uh, it wasn't the best sort of offseason. We didn't get a lot of access as far as we got to talk to players a few times. We didn't get to really watch any practice. But I think the encouraging thing is that Lincoln Riley took those six weeks with a staff that was in flux. And shout out to Taylor Mays, our former colleague here at the Peristyle. You know, he uh, I think he did a really nice job with the secondary. They look like a well-coached team. They used six weeks well. Um I remember, I think it was USC played Wisconsin in the Holiday Bowl and Clay Helton was the coach and they only practiced like seven times or something and they just get, you know, they got beat by, beat down there. And it, you could tell, okay, they didn't use this practice time uh, well. And I think it's because they he fired a bunch of his staff or something, if I if I remember correctly. So tell me in the chat if I was wrong or whatever. But um, this was well used, even though you're doing all the recruiting and everything like that. I felt this was encouraging that they could coach up this smaller group of guys, not as talented group of guys without your number one pick in the NFL draft and still come up with a good game plan and something that could you could get a win where they just weren't able to do that, especially in the second half of the season. They just weren't able to figure out a way to get a win. And they did that. And I think it's encouraging that the coaches were able to do that. If you remember like when like Max Wittick would come in, it was like, oh, he looks good. And then, oh, they got coached for a week and then he looks worse. Like it, the coaching seemed to hurt. Do you, you remember that? Like it was like, the more coaching they got, it hurt the players' chances of doing well. And this was encouraging that they got a bunch of coaching and they played better. And maybe that's is going to Connor's point of not feeling the pressure. You know, when there's not the, no pressure on you in that that Max Wittick example that you give, you come in, you ball out, and then the next week, okay, I'm the guy now. Everything and everyone's focused on me, and that maybe maybe changes things. So maybe that plays into it a little bit. But I think again, it comes back to the the group playing for each other. Like, again, I, I say it, it, it's one of the, the most underrated aspects of football in general. It's just because there's so many things happening on a football field at one time with 11 on 11 that, you know, if you don't really care about the person beside you and it's just a paycheck or it's just a, you know, fun time, fun hobby for you, then, you know, you don't ex expend that extra one percent two percent whatever it is to dive and make a block or whatever to dive and hold on to a guy you know that's pulling away from you so someone else can get there to make a tackle you don't strain that extra bit if you don't love the people around you if you're playing for the people around you you go to another level it's the you know it's the classic mom lifts a car because the baby's stuck type of thing when someone you care about is in danger or whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be an extreme example like that. But, uh, you know, when someone you care about is something's going to happen to them, you jump in and you go to an extra level. And I think that's what we saw from that group. They cared about each other. They played for each other. And it all starts, for me, with Miller Moss in the middle. I agree with all that. I mean, Tosh Washington, you talk about lifting cars. I feel like he's been lifting cars all season for USC. And, Lincoln Riley, after the game, talked about how if you know Taj, you know that he was never going to opt out of this game, and he gets to 1,000 yards, catches two touchdowns. He was sensational in this game, and he went on this little soliloquy about the six weeks, how 
it was one of his favorite times at USC, which like, if you had told me he was going to say that before the game, I would have been like, that's a guy who, in my opinion, I'm sure he can't wait to get out of there and go to the NFL. But he really took that to heart. And it just seemed like the bond of the team was, was really, really, it just got a lot bigger during that six week period. I think that's a credit to Lincoln Riley, a credit to the coaching staff. And that's another reason why fans deserve to be excited for next season. I think all of a sudden, even though Taj is leaving, but the receivers behind them are really good. You have a really good core going into the Big Ten. And I, I think there were some serious question marks about that core leading up to the Holiday Bowl. One game doesn't fix everything, but finally there's some positive stuff to talk about. And I, I think the recruiting class that they had in 2023, the guys who are still there, that's going to be a really, really big base of talent for you in the Big Ten. And a lot of those guys show that they can play last night, which was huge. Yeah. A um, couple of things that we'll get to uh, questions. We're trying to wrap this up in 20 minutes or so. Uh, USC basketball tips off against Oregon at the top of the hour. And of course, uh, if you want to see Arizona and Oklahoma play, that starts at 6.15 too. I'll definitely be watching that one. Um, I want to give a little shout out to Jalen Smith, who uh, one of my favorite players on the team. And, uh, you know, childhood friends with Miller Moss, you know, Bishop Alamany. He gets the defensive MVP. I don't know if I've ever seen this, 12 tackles all solo. And uh, he moved over to play safety because Shaka had mentioned before, there's just a lot of guys were out there. You know, Kalen Bullock wasn't playing. So, I mean, a lot of guys were missing in the secondary. He stepped up and uh, I thought he had a really good game. Yeah. I, I, J-Rock's one of my favorite uh, guys on the team. Um, same thing with Miller. Like, I, I feel like I've known this kid for a decade now. Um, so seeing him, especially when you can watch the Snoop documentary, Snoop League documentary as well, to see him as a, as a true kid. I didn't know him back then. Uh, but from the Bishop Alamany days, premium seven on seven. You know, both of those guys were teammates at both of those spots. You know, like you said, you know, very close friends and came to USC together. And, you know, to see them ball out like that was really fun. 12 tackles, career high for Jalen Smith as well. And like like you said, being thrown into position, he has not practiced all season. And for you, Shotgun, I wonder with the transfer portal additions, maybe we don't know at this point, but I feel like Kamari Ramsey, I really – like him as one of the safeties. Do you think Jalen Smith will play alongside him? Do you think he'll stay at nickel next season? Is that, am I getting ahead of myself? Do you have any idea with that? Cause I'm fascinated by his performance last night. I thought he played really well and he had a solid season at nickel. Could he be the other safety besides Ramsey? Do you think? I think the interesting thing will be, it'll be depending on where Kenley Arnold lines up because there's a potential where you put both those guys at nickel back you can run more dime if you want to. We saw, we actually saw Eric Gentry. You know, they did some different alignments last night, some different things defensively that kind of threw off Louisville a little bit. We saw some basically a four-three alignment with three linebackers, but we saw Eric Gentry kind of split out as a nickelback. And I kind of said, "Hey, he's playing nickelback, or maybe he's just being split out." Him and Chris Thompson were on the field together as the the outside linebackers. So there's just a lot of options in that nickelback spot. Um, you know, if all those guys end up returning. So I think that's fascinating. And I thought Anthony Beavers looked really good last night. You know, I mentioned him as a guy I thought with some extra opportunities could make some plays and, you know, really finish the game strong with that that punch. I mean, it looked like he'd been on the heavy bag, you know, throwing some some hooks in there. That was a perfect punch on there. You know, if that would have connected with the rib cage, that might be a broken rib or something there for, for the Louisville uh, ball carrier on that one. But he looked really good. So I think you have options. And, you know, there's always going to be injuries and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I think Jalen Smith, so what he can do here, just gives Danton Lynn another piece of the puzzle, another piece where they can move around, uh, you know, uh, something that, that they can, you know, put him at safety and put him at nickelback is, is Akili Arnold has played cornerback in the past. You know, so John Humphrey's coming in. You know, they had a good showing from Jacoby coming in and Prophet Brown. We'll see if they bring anybody else into the cornerback room. But – What's the pieces there at cornerback? And you know, competition is the best thing. If you can get better and better because you're competing each week, uh, then you know that's something you want to see as well. So I, I don't think anything's answered there, but that definitely opened my eyes to say, okay, maybe you need to look at Jalen Smith because Jalen Smith was the guy that Alex Grinch really liked in that nickel position of what he could do because he's a physical guy, even though he's not the biggest guy. He is physical playing that nickel spot in the slot to help out with the run. So now – 
Do you feel like you can leave him there, or do you want him to cover a little bit more at safety and kind of run around like he did last night and go make plays? Um, you know, I thought the safety play was fantastic last night. I thought Max Williams looked really good in the nickelback spot, coming off the edge, getting the strip sack as well. Um, so great to see him have a highlight going out, his final game. Him and Justin Dietrich, you know, guys that we've known for the last, you know, five, six years and longer because of their high school stuff. So it was great to see them be able to end uh, on a win. I thought Chris uh, Trevino wrapped it up really well at the end of his ghost notes, his game day ghost notes. If you haven't read that piece yet, it's always one of the best ones each week that there's a game. Um, but just wrapping up what it meant for those seniors and to see them have success at the end in their final game when Max Williams said he hasn't won a bowl game during his time at USC. So to see him have that, that was really cool too. But I think you got some options definitely at the safety and the nickelback spot next year. I think the one thing you look at this team, they were put, especially on the defensive side, players were put in a position to succeed. And I just felt like they weren't that for the whole season. You might have had better players, the assemblage of talent that lined up to play against Oregon and Washington is better than what we saw play against Louisville last night. Now those better offenses, but you could pick any of the games, but I felt like these players were put in a better position to succeed. And after Alex Grinch was fired, maybe there wasn't enough time in those next two weeks to make changes like, Hey, we're going to do this differently. And over the six weeks, you, they could make, you know, I don't know if, if Brian Odom, Sean Newer, were they a part of this or what, but it looked like the players were in a position to succeed as opposed to just being out there flailing and not sure what was going on. I don't know if that makes sense. That makes sense. And just the tackling, like we watched some defensive performances this year where the tackling was awful. And then to see Prophet Brown, I haven't looked at the PFF numbers yet, Shotgun, but I don't believe he had a missed tackle. Like even if he allowed a completion, the guy was going to the ground. There were no yards after the catch. It was just really refreshing. And he was a guy who was pretty low in the depth chart, didn't play a ton when everyone was available at cornerback. So that was a big thing that that I took away from this game, that the tackling improved. And I can't exactly pinpoint why that is, I'm sure a little bit of the game plan had to do with it and the personnel and the desire, but it's not like, oh, they were doing this this week, so then they just tackled better. I, I, I'm a little bit curious. Shotgun, I'm just interviewing you, I guess, here at the end of the show. Do you have any idea why they why they tackled better in this one? Like, Prophet Brown, where where was this from the cornerbacks all season? He, he looked awesome in this one. Prophet Brown did have one missed tackle. Him, oh, Max Williams, okay. and Mason Cobb were the only three guys to have any missed tackles last game, but only one for Prophet Brown. Okay. Um, I just think the angles looked a lot better, in my opinion. Uh, you know, and I haven't rewatched the game yet. You know, so I was watching on TV, so I get a little bit different angle than normally when I'm on the sidelines. But also, when I rewatch and rewatch plays over and over, you see things a little bit differently. But I thought the angles were better, and there were just multiple guys running. So if you were starting to slip off of a tackle, that the other guys come in to help you out. Uh, whereas maybe we didn't see that in the past. And I, I thought that they. They just kind of funneled everything inside, uh, you know, the run game. Now, the run game gashed them a little bit. There were some big plays there. But they didn't let anything explosive in the pass game. And when you don't let any catch and run after the pass game, and that's, again, that's the Prophet Brown. That's the Jalen Smith tackles out in space. Those are game-changing plays. Yeah. And then when you make game-changing tackles like that, suddenly there's a fourth down play and a ball is thrown behind a, a, a wide receiver and the turf monster helps you out. And suddenly, yeah. you know – it looks even better for you. So when you're making plays, I mean, the most impressive, there was two back-to-back -back tackles in wide open space that forced Louisville to punt from their own 36. So if you pick up four more yards in that situation, you're going for it regardless. Because I think it was like third and eight or something. Yeah. Just, or fourth and eight, and they decided to punt it. Like, that, that is game-changing. That's a game-changing two tackles out in space. So, yeah, the, the tackling was, was probably – the most mind blowing team aspect <laughs> outside of the fact that they just came together when I didn't think that was going to happen at all. All right. Well, we got, let's try to um, rapid fire some questions here. We did get a super chat from only natties. Um, uh, how you win matters. A lot of us were tired of watching Caleb bail us out last night. We saw a team win. That's why we're excited uh, for the new Riley. You know, I would I, love to ask Lincoln Riley, what he's learned this season. And I know he w wouldn't tell us exactly what he's learned, but I, I just feel like he has told us a little bit, just the guys who want to be there and, and relying on those guys is so important. When you have 53 guys who want to be there compared to 85, it's probably easier to 
go with the, the fewer guys. But I, I just think he, he did learn a lot this season, and I'm excited for the future now because he, he won some points back last night, in my opinion. Alonzo said, uh, should we expect Will Howard to come in even though Miller had a great game? If not, what young quarterback do we go after? Yeah, kind of get your guys' thoughts on the quarterback situation real quick. I mean, Lincoln Riley said it after the game. He said, Miller Moss probably scared some people off. Yeah. And it, and if you're Will Howard or you're Cam Ward and you're one of those top guys on the market, if Miller Moss is staying put and he tell you know, you come in, go for your visit or whatever, and you talk to Miller Moss personally, and he says, Yeah, I'm gonna stay, I'm ready to compete. We can make each other better. I'm like, yeah, I might go for a different situation just because I want that assurance that I'm gonna be the starter. I didn't leave Kansas State or Washington State to go somewhere and battle for a spot. I went to go be the starter. So I would say I don't think – if Miller Moss is staying and that is the conversation that's had, I don't think Will Howard or Cam Ward ends up at USC. I think I've Riley talked about this too. Uh, sorry, Connor, but just um, – he talked about maybe bringing in two quarterbacks, one like a younger guy that you can develop, and then one would be like the stopgap kind of guy. Well, maybe you only bring in one younger guy to add another scholarship quarterback, but he would be competing with Moss or behind Moss. So I don't know. We'll see. I agree with everything – Shotgun said, if you're Will Howard, you're not going to come if you're not guaranteed the spot. And I've been hearing Ohio, Ohio State rumors with him before Miller even played really well. So that definitely didn't help USC's pursuit of him. And I wouldn't be surprised if Lincoln Riley said, hey, you know, we'd still love to have you compete. But I understand if, if you don't want to come here, maybe the aggression from USC side and the recruitment goes down after Miller Moss plays a huge game. I'm dying to know who they're going to get at quarterback because it's kind of like Dante Moore going to Oregon. He's not going to play, but – it didn't work out for him at his previous stop. He probably should have gone to Oregon from the jump, and he's just looking at a second chance. USC doesn't really have anyone like that. I mean, Jake Garcia was a guy who was in Miller Moss's class who's been all over the place, highly talented yeah. kid. I wonder if USC would look at him, but I, I really he don't know. He was a for a while. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. It's, it's just a very specific situation where, hey, we want you, but we want you maybe in two or three years compared <laughs> to right now. And I don't envy recruiting – quarterbacks like guys in that position Lincoln Riley has the great track record of course but that's so hard there's only one guy you can play and you gotta you know put the pieces to the puzzle like look at Malachi Nelson it is a very very tough position to recruit yeah uh Ham Sammy how much does the bowl win change your expectations for next season I don't know that it necessarily changes my expectations um just for next season what I I wasn't saying whether the bowl game would, would sway them at all. Uh, but I, I think I mean, your expectations for what the team can become as far as coming together, you know, the, it, it'll all depend on how much talent they get and all that. It's a really tough schedule, all those things. Um, and that won't change my expectations now. But I, I am – I do heighten my expectations of what this program can become when they've had such a rough season – to turn things around in that six weeks and find something. I don't know exactly what it is. It's something I'll be digging on the next couple of weeks with, you know, trying to chat with, you know, some families and different things and people around the program. But there's something changed. What was the difference? Was it just, you know, cutting loose some people that didn't want to be there and were bringing things down? I don't know. But that's something I really want to know because that tells me this program can still grow. It felt like, this program had run into a bog and now it seems like, all right, you know, they've gotten through, uh, you know, the princess bride, they've gotten past the, the, the big giant rat beast and now they they're able to move forward. So we'll see what they can do uh, as the off season continues. I do think the schedule of next season is so hard. So even with this nice end of the season, I, I feel way better about the team, but, I, I still think nine and three next season would, would be a really good regular season. Maybe you guys feel differently on that, but I sort of had him at eight and four, nine and three with some question marks. Now I feel better about him at, at nine and three, potentially to shotgun's point. I feel better about the long-term future of the program and Lincoln Riley talking about how he wants to stack high school classes on top of high school classes. And I, I was critical of the 2024 class ranking, but if you can get a percentage of what you're getting down the line from this 20, like it just seems like the 2023 class is going to be awesome. And if the 2024 class can supplement that, then you might be cooking with gas and the long-term prognosis looks a lot better. The other weird thing was uh Lincoln rally comes in roster turnover. That was, we hadn't seen in college football until 
prime, and we've seen some other schools go even crazier than that. And the team chemistry was great. I mean, to get a guy like Travis Dye being like the you know the leader of the whole team, and he's like you know, the Oregon running back for the last several years. And you felt like you could keep doing that, but the chemistry I don't think was good in in year two. And I don't know you know what the reasons behind that were, but it just seemed like the harder year to have great chemistry on your team would have probably been your first year. And it was more difficult in the second year. And maybe some of the guys being gone, some of the highly ranked guys that weren't really participating or contributing, and they're not there, cleared out some space. I don't know what it is, but the chemistry did get a lot better uh, in this game than we see. And, you know, I thought it would be better in year two because you give Lincoln Riley a lot of credit for making it good in year one, which seemed like it would be the harder task, but whatever. Uh, LFG says, uh, any lean regarding um, – John Monheim returning for 2024. It sounds like he's still really weighing his options and it's going to be a tough call for him. So based on what I've heard, it still could go either way. I don't know if you guys have heard anything else. No, I haven't necessarily heard anything, but uh, you know, I think the fact that USC moved him in to guard, is that a showcase game for the NFL scouts or is that, all right, let's start working towards next season. Looking at some of the other moves around, the fact that we didn't see any Alani Noah, the fact that we didn't see a little bit of rotation at right tackle with Jared Kingston and maybe Mason Murphy rotating in there, tells me that would lead me to believe it's more of a spotlight game. But, you know, is it, is that the case all around or is that just the case in that one spot? I don't know. I think if he does come back, it's 100% he's not playing left tackle anymore. He's either yeah. going to guard or center. Yeah. I'm right. sure he'll get a he'll get a draft grade, and then hear what the NFL, uh, you know, advisors, scouts have to say basically about his game. Like, and they'll probably say, "Yeah, we want to see more tape of you inside because that's your position at the next level." Uh, USA Football for Life. Uh, Eric Gentry tweeted last night, sort of like a, a it seemed like it could be a goodbye from the team, but it could also have just been end of the season tweet. What did you guys think about Eric Gentry? Will he be back too? Well, if well, you're a subscriber, then you would know. Aha. Uh -huh. See? Very nice. If you're not a subscriber <laughs> right now, uh, I think we still got the 60% off deal going on. So if I know we got – how many we got people? Like We have over 500 people watching on YouTube. Um, if you are not a uscfootball.com subscriber, I mean, it's totally cheap. 60% off. Yeah, for, for an, an annual membership. So much good information and stuff on there and some insight into uh, what Eric Gentry's treat wa a, a tweet was. The War Room will be tomorrow morning. Lots of great stuff uh, in there as well. So make sure you guys go check that out if you're not a subscriber. And if you do, please jump over to the P, the Peristyle. That's our premium message board. The biggest message board in USC football history. It's been around the longest just because I'm old and I started it, you know, created it by hand writing code back in the day. But yeah, go check it out and say hi to the P. Say hi to me on the P and we'll come uh, say hello. So hopefully you guys can join. And if you are already a member, thank you for that. And we'll do one last one from Steve. Uh, he says, uh, which defensive players uh, can play multiple spots that are likely to excel under uh, Coach Lynn? Thanks. So some versatile guys. Like we'd mentioned Jalen Smith. Like, you know, it seems like he's probably going to get a bump from this. But any other thoughts on uh, defensive players that might excel under Lynn? Sounds like Nate Clifton, the new – defensive lineman from Vanderbilt can play inside or outside. And I'm excited to see how Danton Lynn uses him. That was really the first Danton Lynn recruitment that we saw because Clifton was all in really fast out of the portal right after Lynn was hired. So he jumps to mind there. We talked about Jalen Smith. I think the linebackers are the linebackers. You won't really see too much rotation there, but that question makes me think of guys in the secondary and guys in the defensive line. Yeah. We, we mentioned some of those guys, uh, you know, Eric Gentry is the unicorn. Can you figure out a way to get him to his greatest potential? He is such a unique weapon, but it also takes learning how to mold him into what you need him to be, what he can be. And that takes a little bit of extra effort. We'll see if Denton Lynn can, can get that from him. Uh, Bear Alexander is also a guy that's very versatile, but it will depend on the pieces around him. If USC can't get a true trench tank nose tackle – then you're going to have to leave Bear as ender there because he's the biggest guy and he can work against the center. But if you do, you get a couple guys, 
Now maybe you, you can move Bear from zero tech all the way out to maybe a five, even maybe a seven at times, depending on you know who else you're putting in the game, just because he is a unique pass rusher. So if you get in some of those third long situations, he can be a guy. And how about that play last night? Can we, we touch on that real quick? It Which looks one? like he the the one where he makes a tackle for loss uh, on the running back, and he didn't make a ton of plays in that. He was t- eating up uh, you know some blocks and stuff. Uh, but that play just stood out. It was beast mode. It was a bear mauling in that one because he sits the center back with one hand and basically shoves him into a tight end that's coming across and uses the tight end. It looks like he did it on purpose. Now, I don't know if he did or not, but it looks like he saw the tight end coming across the, the formation and said, let me shove the center into him so that his momentum, the tight end's momentum, is going to take out the center and open me up to go make a play. So he took out two blockers with one hand, essentially, and then he goes and swallows up the running back for a tackle for loss. That's the type of play that Barry Alexander can make. Now, if you put more playmakers around him, and if you can find a way to open up Anthony Lucas, ton of potential, only played a handful of snaps last night. That's a guy they still got to f- figure out a way to, to get him to his potential as well, like uh, Eric Gentry. Those unique athletes, if you can find a way to use them that best kind of accentuates their talents, that's when you your defense can really take off. And Anthony Lucas, you know, with this new ruling on two-time transfers, he's a guy to keep an eye on too with the number of snaps he's played the last half of the season. Um, one last thing. Thank good stuff there. USC Football for Life says, can't afford to subscribe. I need a new transmission and saving for my teen's college tuition. Give up the info, guys. Tell you what. So here's the deal. For $43, you get a year of access to, so it's like you can't even go take your, you know, significant other out to dinner for that for a whole year. Plus you get Paramount plus, which is like a $99 uh, a year kind of deal too. And if, if you do sign up or if anyone signs up watching this broadcast, drop me an email, Ryan at uscfootball.com and I'll add a couple free months to your subscription as well. So you can't afford not to do this. Like you can definitely 43 bucks. Come on. You could do that a whole year of great info. So $3 and 58 cents per month. Yeah. Right so. now, during this current and sixty percent off is, is one of our best deals of the season or best deals of the year. So make sure you jump in, especially with this wild time of the season progressing right now, uh, the off season progressing. Excuse me, the transfer portal and the February signing period, all that type of stuff, coaching movement, all that will be. You want to get the inside access. You want to be a uscfootball.com uh, Paris style member. You got you. I'm obviously a. I'm sorry, Ryan. I'm obviously a homer, but I was subscribed when I was at Sports Illustrated because I was like, I got to see what's going on. I got to get the inside scoop. Yeah, guys, go check it out. So thanks, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, it was great. Thank you for dealing with me. I hope I hope I sounded okay. Like I feel all right. I'm a little. I need to go back on the couch and watch some football and basketball and stuff now. But um, yeah, we uh, with the tunnel vision. I think Connor and I will try to do a show. Sometime next week or whatever. Um, Shotgun, you guys doing any more podcasts? What's your... Helium Boys will be reunited on uh, probably Monday night. So. Monday night. Okay. Oh, that's isn't that New Year's Day? Maybe Sunday night or... Mo- oh, then Sunday night or Monday night. We'll see. we we got to right. figure it out to, to get it. But we'll have something for you guys in the next couple of days as well. Chris has already been sending me ideas for things he wants to do. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the theparastyleshop.com, you can go there and, and look at some of the merch that we merch. have as well for the cilantro boys and the helium boys. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, thanks. Connor Morissette fresh uh, off his trip down to San Diego, flew from the East coast, right to San Diego, gets a ride back up to LA and uh, shotgun Spratling doing all kinds of family stuff. And we're all here, you know, holidays still kind of going on, but we wanted to get you a show. We wanted to talk about this game was shocked at the result of the game that, that we were talking about this excitement heading the off season, but I think it's a great thing for USC fans and hope you guys enjoyed it. So for Connor and shotgun, I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you enjoyed the show and we will talk to you next time. Don't forget to check out USC UCLA women's basketball too this weekend. Top 10 matchup. Nice.